thinking about the stakeholders involved in the curriculum, we need to look at a very wide spectrum. Everything from the medical students all the way up to the dean. Um, folks that are particularly important are those that are course directors, clerkship directors, uh, those are involved in content. Uh, and what's probably even more important uh, is to identify that subgroup of champions uh, because you need champions in the very beginning. So one way to go about doing that would be to go ahead and send out an announcement of the idea of starting an ultrasound curriculum and see what sort of response you get from them. Then to meet with those individuals and really get a sense of what they think about ultrasound, uh, what they think their role may be in ultrasound as well. Because if you can get a champion across a number of uh, courses and clerkships, I think that puts you in a very, very good position. So that way you can get your core group together. You can sense how interested they are in moving forward with this. And you can also get a sense of what role they want to play. I think the same thing would be true with the medical students. Uh, medical students can be a driving force in getting an ultrasound curriculum going. Uh, so one of the things that we did early on was sort of uh, send out a similar sort of announcement, say we're looking at this, we want your input, we want you to feel ownership in this, because it really does belong to the medical students as well. Then the next step would be to get those leaders among the medical students and form an interest group. And the interest group can be very important in, in terms of feedback and also they can help teach uh, as well. So I think identifying the stakeholders, bringing stakeholders together and having everybody feel like they're a part of the program is very, very important. When you're starting an ultrasound medical education program, the budget and funding is, is our key questions. Uh, it's some of the hardest questions to answer. And the first thing you need to answer is, do you have your own time to try to put into these efforts? Because your time is not always gonna be compensated hour for hour. So the person who is the champion that wants to drive this, but trying to find funding is a matter of, again, talking to your direct reports, your chairs, to see if there is ways that uh, your department can help fund these efforts into medical education. You can try to talk with your medical school to try to see are some of the efforts and skill sets you have consistent with what they are trying to teach the students and so finding funding from the College of Medicine. You can try to write grants and research grants and educational grants, and those are a little bit harder. Um, and then there are different programs with, with industry. But I think that when you're trying to budget for funding, it's a really important that it, is this something that you have the time to try to uh, overcome because the budgetary issues are, are, are complex after doing this for 22 years, it doesn't all come at once. And there's a lot of time on the front end that you have to put in where there is not um, requisite funding that's coming in. But as you progress and have a product that then you can work with the medical school, there are ways that you can try to fi find funding from your department, from medical school, from industry. Uh, it's a lot different landscape than it was 20 years ago because there's been a lot more literature, there's a lot more momentum and the machines have gotten a lot smaller. So ultrasound medical education is not a, a big stretch as it was perhaps in 1999 when I started. But I think that perseverance and really allocating, do you have the time for your own, uh, to put into your own budget as far as your, your career goals? Um, but it does pay off in the end uh, by training others uh, but when you're trying to find funding and then trying to find funding for others, it's really important to develop that budget, work with your department, and then work with the college to try to find support for the things that you're teaching that go along with their curricula. Challenge of getting the right experts to teach ultrasound, it has been and probably will always be a huge, huge battle for us. Um, and I think that evolves with how the program uh, develops over time. Um, so in the very beginning, um, just five or six years ago, we were scrambling around to get um, quote unquote experts. Um, really our experts were anyone who were, who was willing to, you know, teach a couple of medical students um, with whatever machine we had, with whatever topics they were comfortable with. Um, so we were, I wouldn't like to say that we we're desperate, but um, we were certainly willing to be flexible around um, who was teaching our students. And we got a lot of feedback from students. So um, I don't 
I don't think that uh, the skill of teaching uh, correlates with years of experience. And I think we all kind of know that with everything that we learned in medicine, um, there's a certain uh, skill set that comes with bedside teaching that is just um, based on uh, how comfortable the learner is with the instructor. And so a lot of, a lot of what we've experienced recently is that our expert teachers are the near peer instructors. So we have a lot of senior medical students that are now teaching our students. They are nowhere um, close to expert level um, in terms of the content, um, but they have learned a certain um, you know, script and understanding and philosophy of how we teach ultrasound. Um, and they have gone on to be very, very good ambassadors um, and stewards of ultrasound. Um, and so we have required less uh, faculty and senior level involvement, um, but uh, exceptional um, feedback regarding our senior medical students. We also have a sonographer educator. Um, she has had decades, I don't wanna date her or age her in any way, but she has had decades of experience um, with uh, the radiology departments um, in, our, in our local area doing ultrasound as a technician, um, but she has been invaluable in the way that we uh, deliver ultrasound uh, education. Um, she is there as a technical support, um, as the equipment support, um, and, you know, kind of someone to bounce ideas off of in terms of um, curriculum and content. The question and the challenge of deciding what uh, content to share with your students um, and what to use as preparation materials uh, will be probably a, a topic of debate uh, among many people. Some are some people are purists and want to develop all their content on their own. Um, sometimes that's actually not based on the instructor um, instructor's decision or the course director's decision. Sometimes schools mandate a certain feel or a certain format of how their content is put up on. Um, you know, whatever uh, electrical forum that they're on or, you know, Blackboard or whatever. And so that part is unfortunate because there's so much good content out there that has been done and redone and edited. Um, and so I think the key thing with um, deciding where to get content, my philosophy, and it's been shown um, in previous uh, people have done this, um, the papers that have been written is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's a lot of great content out there that you as the instructor and director of a course can just review and make sure is appropriate for your level of learner. I would say that that's probably more of the emphasis is to make sure that the content is appropriate for your level of learner, um, that the length of the content is appropriate for the attention span of your learner. Um, and you will know what that means um, based on the type of learner that you teach. Um, and then also to not be overwhelmed by the volume of topics there are. So the scope of topics are, is, is just so wide that I think people tend to become overwhelmed. So for anyone who's starting off is um, just to choose a small handful, less than a handful of topics that you think is uh, important and vital to your institution and to stick with it. Um, and that just because someone else at a different institution is teaching 16 topics, doesn't mean you need to go with 16, 16 topics, that you can teach four topics really, really well and make sure that that content is very well curated um, and updated often um, to, to ensure its quality. Um, so that would be my recommendation is to keep it narrow and focused and prioritized to what your institution um, needs to deliver and then to also not reinvent the wheel if possible. Machines is a very common question, uh, and how many do I need? Um, that will really depend primarily on the class size. Uh, you know, class size is, at least in the United States, average is about 165 per class, but it, the range is from less than 100 to over 300. Uh, so you really do need to look at your class size and how extensive the curriculum is going to be. Is it just going to be basic introductory, or is it going to be uh, more uh, comprehensive, and then you'll need more devices as well. I guess the bottom line would be the more devices, the better. But obviously, you have to fit that uh, into your budget. Um, so I think in terms of um, look at your class size and see what you want to do as well. Um, advantages of a single device, um, it makes it easy, it's efficient, because everybody knows the device, students and, and uh, faculty know the device. And for some faculty, they feel more comfortable helping if they know they 
they know the device that they're going to be using. Uh, so they're, they're more inclined to participate as well. Um, there'll be some limitation in terms of maybe the labs that you can do as well. Um, then in terms of multiple devices, uh, you just get a broader experience because when you go out of here, you're going to have different devices to use. And then the final part of that was uh, AI. No question that AI is going to play a major role uh, in medicine, uh, especially in education. Uh, so I think anytime you can um, get devices that allow self-directed learning, such as with um, real-time labeling of anatomy, such as direction of probe manipulation, uh, such as image quality, all those things are going to help because key is going to really be how much can you turn over to the self-learner. Time in the curriculum um, has been an issue from the very beginning. I think the key to that is, again, a matter of um, what value it brings to teaching. And we know now that students learn content better with ultrasound and they love ultrasound. So I think one, one approach is to start small, um, make sure you uh, don't overwhelm students or faculty, you have some successes, you get good feedback, and then you could expand but spread things out. Instead of packing most of your ultrasound into one or two courses or one or two clerkships, if you spread it out across the curriculum, then you only have to ask for a little bit in each course in each clerkship. Um, and then usually people can tolerate that and it goes well. And then as the student feedback comes, um, then the faculty are starting to ask, can you do some more? Can you do some more? <laughs> uh, so, you know, start small, make sure it goes well, and then things will go well after that. The basics of ultrasound and learning how to use the ultrasound device is best done in laboratories, ultrasound laboratories with exercises, with supervision as well. Also, a lot of online learning material can be very helpful. So when they do get into the clinical setting, it's very efficient and effective when they're over there. I think that's in the best interest of everybody, uh, whether it be the student, the instructor, or the patient. Uh, so we like to make sure they're well prepared before they get into the clinical arena to be able to do that. The pandemic has is, is caused issues for everybody and certainly ultrasound uh, being uh, contact, um, examination. Uh, we've had to change a lot of things. We, we have a great deal of material that we're doing virtually. For example, we're fortunate to have an ultrasound studio uh, so we do a live demonstration in the studio, then we break up into small groups with discussion and review questions and looking at images as well. And that's worked very well. One of the things we have done, the students obviously love the hands-on, so we have done some scheduling spread far apart where students come, they will scan themselves. Let's say they're going to do the knee, they'll have masks, gloves, distancing, disinfectant, all those sorts of things. And it's not what we would like, but I think during the pandemic, they need to get a little bit of hands-on to keep things going. So that's what we've done. Assessment drives learning. And so it's really important to focus on assessment whenever you're trying to start a medical student ultrasound program. It's important that there's a clear objectives and clear curricula of what you're expecting of the students and we have some local versions with our learning management system and then we have some local ways that the students will track the number of exams um, that they have. You can work with industry that's having other tools to try to help you track um, some of the various ways that people are saving scans, having those images reviewed. Um, we have a series of courses that we have put together and one of the best ways that we assess is with an oral exam where they actually present their portfolio. And when they put, present their portfolio, they present in a groups of three and then we go over the images and then we ask questions on those. If the first student doesn't know the answer, then we go to the second student. So there's group learning during this assessment. They may not all know the same kind of things, but it gives a way to look at their images give them critique and feedback, and then see where their other classmates are with some of the same objectives.
We thankfully have uh, a very rigorous and uh, detailed way that students give feedback to us um, at our medical school. Um, we have a weekly uh, course reps. Um, so the course reps uh, are the students who come and sit uh, at the end of every week, uh, I actually just came from one of those meetings um, where they review every lecture, every small group, every activity that was in the schedule for the week. Um, and the students give very candid feedback about what um, they thought went well, what they thought could have gone better. And um, the representatives truly do represent their class. Um, so the comments really filter through them. When you're setting up a program, we developed a model pool where the students would serve as models. We thought that that was a pejorative term, and so we changed it to TSEPT, a trained simulated ultrasound patient. So the students would serve as models, and our paper that we wrote on this was TSEPT as model, learner, and teacher. So they're first that they're a model, then they learn just by osmosis, by sitting there as people are scanning on them, then they become teachers. So the program, uh, is a program where students participate voluntarily. They sign a contract that says they will um, are okay with the scanning, that they will speak up if anybody does any scanning that they feel uncomfortable with. We have a, a, a safety monitor that is in every session. So the TSUPs will sign off with the safety monitor that they are okay to model and that they model through the session. When issues come up, such as incidental findings, uh, we found dual collecting system or thyroid cysts. Those come on when you're scanning for education and scanning uh, regular people and patients. So we have a handbook in our simulation center with a policy that actually talks about incidental findings where the student is responsible working with the faculty that's present to save that image and then they take that to the PCP, the primary care physician, and tries to get um, further workup or answers if there is a question or concern. So the first step is we saving the images. The second is talking with the faculty that's present. And the third is really putting the onus on the student as the patient to try to contact their primary care physician and, and follow up. So we have a policy and there's actually a paper written about, about this. But I think it's important when you're doing to think of some of the legal aspects and to really frame the, your ultrasound in a way that people understand what is going on uh, in the simulation setting. Um, in the clinical setting, um, they're there in a, in a clinical uh, uh, situation. And so the findings go into the chart. If it happens to be an educational scan where the images are not going into this, the chart uh, and there's an incidental finding, um, we will follow up with the direct team that's taking care of that patient and inform them so they can get the appropriate testing or have the patient follow up. So the legal issues are both different in the simulation center that we have policies versus the clinical uh, setting.